the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people are evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family member was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of Hawaii Tracker, bringing you guys another Hawaiian Volcano Tracker update. We're going to cover Kilauea, Mauna Loa, we'll talk about Kama Ehua Kanaloa, formerly known as Loihi, had some earthquakes this week. And we're also going to bring you guys, in a little less than an hour, at 6pm Hawaiian time, we're going to switch over to try to stream for you guys the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park public meeting that's happening today on the EEA for all of the disaster recovery projects that are ongoing there. So um, we will uh, talk about the filling of the crater, which is the, the main story. Lava is still up there circulating around. There is no increased threat to anyone. The gas is still fluctuating and the log is still coming around. But otherwise, we'll look at the little details, some pictures, some lava viewing videos we have from our viewers submitted this week. Um, Dane will be collecting questions in the chat, monitoring the chat. Let us know if you have any issues with our audio or video. Um, and Dane, you got a nice rainbow picture of the week you selected for us once again today. Every week we seem to have one, huh? Yeah, it's just a matter of going through the archive and finding the rainbows, or the best rainbow. Um, we tend to always get them, especially with how much rain we've been getting recently. But yeah, yeah it's a, seemed to be a fan favorite as well. But you get, I like those hornitos down there in the, directly in the middle of that one. Uh, yeah, just, you know, like, yeah. Ex so it just exemplifies rained. it a little bit. Everything's steaming. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, um, otherwise we got a good uh, little session here. We got a bunch of stuff lined up to go through. So we only got a little bit of time to get through it before the White Volcanoes Park uh, update that we want to bring to you live as well. So let's get into it. All right. I'll get to it.
So we'll start off today with some monitoring data. So there's a remote picture taken from our B1 camera that we'll get back to here in a second. But I was going to start off this week. Uh, this is a map from a couple weeks ago that was released with data from July 7th. And I just wanted to follow up on this because this is the question we've, I've gotten several times. Uh, we've gotten it over the last few weeks here. So the data from two weeks ago, July 7th here, was, was uh, 25 million gallons, 95 million cubic meters. But we move right along to USGS update today for Kilauea. It says that there was an overflight on July 19th and showing the crater it now has 98 million cubic meters or 26 billion gallons of lava. That's 12 days. So in about 12 days or two, two, two weeks or so, we've had an extra billion gallons of lava or about 3 million cubic meters of, of lava come in there. The crater floor is now up at, at this 437 foot above the, the beginning of this eruption. Uh, I'll, I'll put that all in perspective. I won't just keep reading numbers for you guys here. But that's, that's where that number comes from. And so we can actually, on our uh, volume map, put in a new data point over here at this right end at 98. Right? So if I zoom, in, zoom it in here, you can see a little more closely that uh, our 12 days ago, or it was under 95. Before that, it was 92 and a half. And you can see that in between these, these times when we have these measurements reported, we can then calculate a rate of increase, right? So you can see the rate was a little higher, went a little bit lower, and it's picked up a little bit since it, then. And overall, it's been steady coming up. And it looks like the rate's still still ongoing, right? Um, this is an image from the um, USGS that I've modified here. So we've shown you this before. This is showing an orange at the top, the 2018 collapse. Um, down here at the bottom in blue is how much the water had filled in. This is in cross-section. The crater that collapsed was, it was that much right in there. And then in red was the first five months of eruption uh, from December 2020 to May 2021. And in pink here, that's what we've had so far in this last, uh, we're almost at 10 months now, right? Um, this 98 million cubic meters, 26 million gallons right there, right? So um, this, is, this is basically the side view. But I put these volumes on here to really, really show you, because if you look at the depth, really we got most of that depth early on with that first eruption. And we've had not as much depth, but we've had a, had a, a much greater increase in volume, right? So over twice the volume, um, and as far as what's left, uh, what's left is 661 million cubic meters or 175 billion gallons there. So that gives you an idea if we're going something like 1 billion gallons every two weeks, right? Then it's going to take uh, 150 weeks there. Yeah. Get all the way to that, that caldera level there. So depending where they measure, measure to this bottom of the Halimau crater or the actual caldera floor, you're then either between 17 to 20% of the way refilling that collapsed from 2018, right? So we've been at this for a year and a half, uh, going on two years, basically. Um, so um, what's a year, year and a half, I guess? Uh, so we can make projections based on that rate right there. So I just wanted to show you this, this side view here. Let's show you some of the, the incremental volumes, right? So um, our most recent number is actually 3.1 cubic meters per second. I found an error in a spreadsheet the other day. So uh, we actually had been higher at 4.8 and dropped down to 1.3, it seems like. And we've bounced back up. So we've seen little variations like this before. We had one over here where we went down from 3.9 to 2.1 and back up. We can see one previously back here where the data bounced around a bit, especially as we're measuring only incremental. Right, so the point is it's still um, ongoing at 3.1 cubic meters per second. And take that value to, to make a projection then. And by those projections, it would hit that next down drop block uh, still sometime in November. Um, allow some error. It could be, you know, as soon as October if it were to pick up. Or it could be as late as December if it were to slow down. And you can see to get back to the point of that where the lava lake was before in 2018 would take it well into 2026. So we're talking about a uh, further four years on still. So this still has a long, long way to go, uh, even though it's coming up a lot closer and it's really dramatic how it's filling the hole. As far as volume, which is what matters, we're not quite there yet. So let me show you this little annotation. And I can zoom into it here, look at the actual what's happened so far. And that first eruption we filled in 743 feet 
The second one so far, we're at 437 feet. So altogether, that puts it at 1178 feet if you go by the written update. Right? You can also look at the graph, the graph uh, labels, and that one puts it at 366. So there's a little bit of error in there, obviously, on depending on what point you're measuring and all that. But 366 puts it right around 1200, 1201 feet. So we're right around that threshold of 1200 feet total fill from the 2018 collapse where we are currently. And we put in a lot of that depth, but only at most 20% of that volume. Right, if that makes sense. That's kind of how to break that down. Right, and worth noting, these are all just preliminary. We're pulling this from the, the raw USGS preliminary reports. And at some point, I may publish something more accurate than this. That caveat said, to show you guys now the uh, thermal time lapse from an F1 camera for the whole last nine and a half months. So showing from September 2021, lava coming in and filling, flooding that crater floor and then rising the, filling that crater, lifting that hardened crater floor and rising that entire time, right? So that's what we're seeing here. Just in review visually since I've been showing you so many graphs. And I will just show one more set of monitoring data graphs here, and then we'll move on to showing you guys uh, time lapses and other pictures. But to make sure we cover our bases here, uh, the summit GPS, this is a distance north to south across the summit caldera. And it usually, distance gets larger and spreads apart as magma comes in and fills underground. So you can see it's still doing that. The trend is still upwards, just some, some variation, small scale. I'm going to zoom in, you guys can see it here. Some small scale variation. But we've seen that before. You can see that there's always been a range of some kind of envelope that contains all of this. And that's still heading upwards essentially there, right? So uh, as much magma as, as is feeding the eruption uh, is, is coming out um, into that summit area, there is still some buildup occurring underground, um, at least movement of that south caldera wall further apart from that north caldera wall, which is uh, usually a combination of magma filling underground and then the south flank wiggling out a little bit too. But in this case, you have to imagine there's a lot of magma building underground. This plot just below here is the similar north to south distance across the east rift zone by Pu'o, the middle east rift zone. You can see that in contrast, this line is going down. That means that this distance is contracting. The north part of it and the south part are getting closer together. This distance over here in meters is, is going down. And you can see the rate is fairly unchanged. There's some small scale variations as well. As you see, we've had this before where it seems to some, sometimes flatten out a little bit and do that kind of thing, right? And so maybe that's happening in here. and. Um, in any case, a long-term trend seems unchanged, and it's probably not worth discussing any further. Everything looks calm for the East Rift Zone so far still, um, Middle East Rift Zone, even this upper part that erupts most often without even uh, having to put any, any magma fur further than that. People live in the Lower East Rift Zone. So the Lower East Rift, everything looks good. Once again, it's July and all is clear. So. Looking at the summit lava depth from the very beginning of the eruption in September until now, I mean, I, I'm calling this uh, September to now, the beginning of the eruption, or in the first part. It's been straight up at the early on part, and then a more gradual increase that's continued ever since. We've seen this variation in the signals where we have a lava uh, lake being measured by the laser rangefinder. And you can see that the pattern is a little bit more spaced out here. Um, it's right under the graph where we are presently than we were seeing, seeing before, which is interesting. And let's zoom it in. So looking at the last month, here's a lava depth, which is what we're seeing at the, in that top panel. And just below it is our one month summit tilt. This is a proxy for the pressure in the summit reservoir, uh, magma reservoir of the, the volcano. And we've seen these, these big swings. This is deflation, inflation cycle, as we, as we call them. Inflation, inflation cycle. The most recent one we had had this kind of funny three stage one, two, three return, like almost like I had two small deflation cycles in between it there. And that seems to have extended the signal a little bit longer than the previous two, which were already on a five days down and two day up on average kind of pattern. So we're seeing similar kind of cycle now. If we look at the right end of this graph, we are currently once again on a downswing. And this is thought to just be a normal 
process of the volcano's magma overturning when you have the denser gas, more gas poor stuff flushing down. And as it flushes down before, uh, before that, that, that replacing magma can come back up, um, you have that withdrawal and drop in the pressure. So it seems to be doing that more so in the last month than it was before, which is interesting. Um, that corresponds, in fact, with that slight slowdown that we saw in the eruption rate. It seems like, especially since the 7th, which is on this graph right in here, right? So from this point on, even though the tilt isn't that much higher, even though the lava depth isn't necessarily that much higher, the uh, photogrammetry, the, the pictures and the models they make of the crater from their, their helicopter overflights are showing them a larger volume um, just in these last two weeks. Right? So uh, climbing up a little bit faster, catching up there. So zooming in a little bit more, well, first, first looking at the gas. The gas has uh, been varying within this recently normal range, about 3,000 to 500 tons per day, uh, and corresponding to the summit tilt and pressure. So when it's in this high, high ground tilt areas, typically have a high gas value if it's measured, because these are not always, this is not automatic. It has to be out, gone, out, gone out and measured manually. So when you see one of these, that's, that's what that's showing. That's a normal range. And so there's been so much time in the down that there's been better air, but uh, you would expect that to come back up. Um, in between these deflationary phases. For the most recent phase, even though we've climbed back up in this three, three stage um, tiers here, a three tier climb here, um, we've actually seen not quite as high of gas values. Um, now we're back in deflation, so you expect this probably going to stay a little bit low. So perhaps you could say that we're trending a little bit on the lower side, um, but there is a little bit of data missing graph for sure. So now we zoom in to the, to the last week. And just over the last week, you can see just the tail end of coming out of this deflation inflation cycle, and just the inflationary part. Here's that first, first phase, and that second here, and that third one right here. And then our, our most recent drop that corresponds to, once again, our summit tilt, which is likewise showing that pattern. So seeing that, we can then uh, switch over to looking at the, uh, the webcams. And to start with, just show you guys what it looks like right now on uh, the last 24 hours from the KW camera. Put up our weekly summary here. That's what we're doing. So you see lava circulating in a persistent lava lake in the center, as usual. And really, in the last few days, we've seen some ooze ups on the left side, which is the north part of the crater here. So we'll, we'll look at that in a little more detail. Let's go back and look at the whole week's time lapse. This is here. See, early in the week, we're still in that climbing phase. We haven't really peaked. So, no, no ooze up flows visible until right there around uh, midweek. And then you see it coming in um, at that left edge. Otherwise, you see glow from the vent. You see glow from that west vent pond area. And then you see that circulating area itself. You can zoom in a little more, but we'll get a different view from the thermal camera of this as well as the v1 camera zoomed in a little bit or two so that said let's move on to let's just focus more closely on the ooze up flows i'm going to just crop it to the little left side here so you can see what that might look like a little more detail and you can see this is that edge of the current filling crater and that's the lava is liquid underneath all that stuff here all, all through here this is all Crusted area and it's leaking out beneath a hardened crust and oozing up here between the collapsed crater wall and this filling zone. So it's kind of a ramp, it's been filling in and filling this area. And when we talk about that next down drop block area being 900 meters, we're talking about this zone all in here, right in there. there. There's also one that's back off in that direction. You can't so more ooze ups in the past week. Since we haven't seen as many, well, I thought we'd focus a little more closely. Looking um, from the other side of the crater, this is our intral rainbow shot in the B1. There's a two hornitos that uh, we've seen. You can see one of them is glowing here at night. And on the far side, our active lava lake with our ooze ups visible over here on the right. It's 24 hours. Let's once again go the last full week. 
And once again, not a whole lot of action on this eastern side, the closer side. Dosing glow in the crater here. Glow from the vent, and then now you see these ooze ups coming in on the right side over there. So there it is. Once again, let's just focus just on that ooze up portion of the video. So that's what this is over here. And first, I'll zoom into the ooze ups themselves a little more closely so you can see how they are also causing that, that uh, older critter wall that's probably uh, has some remnant water in it. It's causing a lot of steam to come out of there um, as a lava is onlapping onto that ramp on the side there. The other thing I wanted to point out in this video. It's pretty cool. I'll have to turn it out right in here. You see this this whole segment of the crater floor just pops upwards. Like it takes about an hour if you start looking closely. I can catch it again. There, there it goes right there. You guys saw that. Interesting to see how these how the lava is filling beneath the crust. The crust would just pop up, and you can see that the, the hinge of this zone is that old central crater floor from that last eruption. And you see that same crack that we've been discussing being that boundary um, of, that, of that zone for a while still visible here with the gas coming out of one of those zones right in there. So that was worth pointing out in a little more detail, but let's keep it moving. Uh, we might have a view from the S1 camera, which with those ooze ups here on the north side, but the S1 camera unfortunately is still down. Just wanted to note that for our records here and Keep moving and look at the F1 camera, which in the last 24 hours, you can see the lava level is is uh, fairly high. We don't see a huge amount of gap between this purple and this orange right in here, in the area right in there. That's the showing the wall of the crater that's above the lava level and with that upper crater floor. Once again, the last week in time lapse, and since we can't really see the the over the Who's up flows? They're off in this corner up here. You don't see a whole lot. Um, I'm um, you know, just zooming it into the active vent area right over here. Let's go in again. So the west vent area is glowing. There's the west pond glowing as well. We don't really see a whole lot of lava in there. You see that southeast pit with a intact um, archway submerged. Lava is going through that archway underneath the crest right there. And otherwise, all you see is this this area of the lava rising upwards and squeezing that little magenta zone between the orange and the purple, smaller and smaller and smaller. That three phase here uh, refilling that we saw on the graph earlier. Okay, the V1 camera I zoomed way in, and you can see similar that three stage rising. Till the end of the video here, and before it loops back around, you see it's actually pretty close to the top of that far crater wall. So I'll zoom it in so it's more obvious. See it filling in a little more easy that way. See where the lava goes down into that arch or somewhere a little upstream of that. That's where you see a bunch of spattering occurring. That was there was that that archway down. And also it's coming in and spattering. On this eastern segment there and also spattering on this northeast segment so again you see it rising up higher it's almost almost building an inner an inner levee right in here right it looks like it's because the lava level has been low for a little while it's building an extra little levee on the inside of this of this crater cliff closely here right if you look right in there it used to be that we'd see this lava disappear off screen here to the left down here at the bottom beginning of the, beginning of the loop but by the end of the loop right here you see that this far part is crusting over right in here a little bit and now we have a little levee forming within that pit right in there so that's interesting to see a little detail and V1 camera for the last 24 hours, lava level is high once again. Pretty much a current view. I'm going to keep it moving here, and we'll talk about our hazards next.
So our main hazard is still VOG. And here is our VOG forecast from the VOG mapping project. And we're putting in 2,000 tons per day as our input. And winds are blowing this um, currently to the southwest. But with the kind of stormy weather we've had, and not super stormy, but variable winds, and there's been some moisture coming through, it's not been terrible um, for uh, the area where I personally am. Um, but you can see the VOG has been getting caught, and it's been swirling, and there have been some mornings, especially where I've been able to smell it not that far away. So it's still around, it's still impacting the, the, the same areas as usual. Impact still ongoing and we don't want to diminish it. Um, but we really don't have a whole lot more to add. We can show you guys the Purple Air Citizen Science map. If it'll load for us here. There it is. You can see mostly we're in a green. There are some spots that even though in a green now, if we go back for the last week, as usual, we can see that there are times where, where the peaks are a little bit higher. But nothing even in the yellow this past week, so better than, better than most weeks. Move on from that. Seeing as we're a little on time today, and we're going to bring you guys that National Park meeting in about half an hour here. So in a National Park, the National Park uh, air quality sensors are all green. The wind is blowing offshore of Kahuku, so all day it's been in the green. We go into the by site. We can scroll down and see that even there we've been in the green for the last day and a half or so. It's showing on a graph here. So that is our volcanic hazard. It's not really a whole lot different than, than it's been. Maybe a little bit better, but it's still happening, of course. So we'll switch to lava viewing. It's a nice map of the park showing Kilauea caldera, Kalua Pele. The lava is in this inner pit here, Hale Makumaku crater, right? And a collapse area of 2018 is here, in case you need a reminder. Their whole main caldera is all through here, and most of that is, is closed off. So you're up on this upper rim of the caldera to look in at the lava from whichever angle you can. The viewpoints are largely in the north, northern areas between Uwekahuna and Kilauea Overlook. Closer to Uwekahuna, right in here, there's a view through a gap. You can see this eastern side of the crater, and whenever there are ooze up flows over there, you might see them. You can't see the main lava lake directly, although there is uh, plenty of glow and beautiful glow from everywhere across the summit area. Um, back over here in the eastern side of the caldera at Kupi Na'ipali, also known as Waldron's Ledge. Where you can walk from the entrance station or the volcano house, only a quarter mile, all paved, you get a view from the east and see that lava lake across the, the crater. A little bit of further view, but a um, much shorter walk. This eastern side uh, does, um, does sit in the rainforest, on the edge of the rainforest there, so sometimes it's a little bit imp impact impacted by weather. But the third site here in the south, Kanakako, is also fairly exposed. So really, you're gonna you you're exposed um, to some degree, regardless. Just make sure you're prepared. We'll talk about that here shortly. Uh, but the third site here, Kanakako, in the south, right? Um, always check the national park website. You can see current closures. You can see current viewing conditions from the V1 camera see the map of all the locations that I just pointed out to you guys right here. You can see all kinds of other information about each trail, where to park, how far it goes, what you might need, all those kind of things. Right? Before and after views, so fantastic working website here. So that's the, the viewing check. Um, the V1 camera oh, back here. V1 camera currently looks like this. The lava levels are high, the lake has been persistent and it's been there, so you can check it if you're extra paranoid. Um, but we can do better than that today. Once again, to remind you guys, here's a view. This is a view from uh, from the north, Uwe Kahuna, from a few months ago. A picture that my wife took. And there is that gap where you can see some of these lava overflows popping up. Uh, the view from the south, Kanakako'i. Here is our video clip from Two Pineapples. Um, Mauna Loa in the background. Lava Lake is small in that area right in there. 
easily visible uh, in the dark. And our first uh, viewer submitted video comes from Fabian Murky or Fabian, I'm not sure how to say it. Apologies for mispronunciation and thanks for sharing. So July 17th, from that south Kanakako'i side, you can see here, I've sped it up a little bit, flow of the lava from that far exit point and the vent up here spattering, throwing chunks of lava in the air as the lava is flowing down and around. Pretty cool. Nice to see someone else submit uh, uh, what they've seen. So um, anyone else is up, up and around, let us know. Send in your videos of what the viewing looks like for you guys. And with that, we'll turn to that eastern side, Kupina Ipali, and here is a video that I took um, a little while ago, just showing where the lava lake sits within that landscape and that closer in view. But really, I'm going to show you guys our old friends, two pineapples, um, have a submission for us this week, and lots of different little views. You can see the the vent up here in the top right. Now we're looking at that central eastern sink and as the lava goes down in there you can see the spatter coming up and the orange lines are the, the the gaps between the slabs the plates and the crust right you can see them a little more easily now that the light's coming up a little more you see that darker area is the hardened lava skin and the seams in between where the lava is coming up still more liquid and hasn't hardened yet hasn't cooled yet See that massive amount of gas coming out there, mostly from the vent area, but you see it from the lake as well. Battering there coming from that central vent area. Now we're zoomed in on that northeast vent area. And these guys have, have really nice cameras and really great zooms. When you do zoom in that far, if it's a little bit windy, then or if it's a lot windy, I should say, right? Then you get these little bit of shakes. So there's a little bit of shake here in the video, but we appreciate them sending it in. And a little bit more daytime view of that northeast sink area. Awesome views of the spatter. Lots of cool stuff to see in a park still. And you can imagine the park will be in great demand in the years to come with all this great viewing around. And that's why they want input later today. Um, their every efforts. So uh, switching now to some of the gas vents, you can see that this is that uh, um, southern crater wall. You can see some fuming spots, some sulfurous deposits on the walls. Um, interesting how um, the, the steam isn't coming out necessarily everywhere, but certain areas, right? Those, those ridges in particular, where they're coming out. And you imagine there's going to be more water flow, um, groundwater flow in certain areas uh, of the prim perimeter of that crater than others. That looks like that, um, not quite clear if it's that, that Hornito area or maybe it's that uh, pond, that um, West Vent Pond area. And that's the West Vent itself there. Well, actually, no, that's that, that Southeast Sink visible over top of the island, the, the top of the island, the central island there at the bottom. So such a large landscape with a, a big zoom, you can really focus it on all different parts of the area, right? There's that wider shot to give you guys a better idea of what's visible there. So a video taken just yesterday. And across, on low on the background. Ea trees. So much cool stuff in there and different every single day for every different unique thing. So mahalo you guys for sending in that extended submission. We've missed you guys the last few weeks. Okay, so now we will switch over to our media of the week from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and USGS. This is actually all USGS. So I was going to start off by showing you guys uh, th this series of old old images. This is actually the National Park releases. I can like, confuse myself here. But an old USGS image from pre-2018 where you see the, the whole... Jaguar Museum and HVO complex on the rim here, and that crater of Hale Ma'uma'u as it looked before 2018, with that inner overlook crater that was fuming out there. Right, this is this is actually the remnants of the 1924 blast explosion that occurred on the summit, and refilled with lava ever since then. So that was a view 
pre-2018. And that is the view um, in 2018, post-2018 collapse. Not exactly the same view. The uh, observatory is over here. Filby Overlook is down here, but you see we're missing all the land here in the background that all fell away. And you really don't see anything besides a cliff uh, getting truncated off there. And put that in comparison with image just released um, this past week. Right? So here we are once again, aerial image of that Jagger Museum area, which is one of the areas under discussion for um, restoration back to a more natural state. And now in the background, you see that that inner pit has this big crusted lava lake visible there, that active lake itself being here, and then the actual uh, central island being right there, and there's a whole landscape, the whole collapse being. So when, you're, when we talk about how far it's got to come to refill, we're talking about it refilling this entire area to get back to where it was in 2018. It's still only 17% only of the way there, we'll call it. Okay, some other images. These are all are released July uh, 19th from the overflight. And looking up at Mauna Loa, there is the fence line and the strip road in a national park that's fenced from the grazers. And then the actual ranch, where you see all grassy here. And you might note that there is no smoke visible here, right? So that fire uh, fully contained and I haven't heard, heard that it's all the way out, but I imagine that they're close, if not quite there yet. So we'll come back to that a little bit later, talking about Mauna Loa. But there is that video we just saw of the caldera with Field Jaguar Museum, Uekahuna area. Looking back at Mauna Loa and the ranch area there with Lava Lake in the foreground, there is a most active area. Persistent lake and then whole crested zone all around. Moving, it looking more vertically and around from the north to the south. Now we've this, described this as almost having little cat ears, like there's one and there's the other. Right, so north is this way, and there's actually lava. I can't tell very easily, but zoom it in. Maybe you tell there's a little spot of red right in there. But there's no need to keep zooming into that one because they actually took the, the zoomed in photograph right here. Awesome. One of those ooze up flows in the daytime, what it might actually look like. So all this stuff in here that looks like it's it's a grayish black is actually liquid and hardening with a very thin skin. And you can see it red just over here on this right side. Um, this one separate, so we could zoom it in. Let's see how that looks zoomed in, right? There, there it is leaking out of that crack. And maybe right in here, you can see almost like a sausage rising up from in between those, those slabs rising upwards. It's a lighter colored sheet. And here is fresh lava that's been coming out from the crack moving this way. There's another crack right in here with lava coming out. A triple junction. Then one over here. That's what it looks like in the daytime. A little, little more silvery. But if you were uh, watching this in person, you'd still see it moving, shimmering with the heat coming off of it and all of that. There's that closer in view. Okay, moving on to finish off these photograph series. Another view of that main active lake. And this is a good one to look at the series of cracks we've been discussing, right? So we're looking from the north once again, but you see there is that, that west vent area and the west vent pond area and another humeral zone. And you can see this crack very clearly extending around this way, right? We actually see a second crack forming out over here. And now we see a crack from this island north this way as well. I'm clear what's happening beyond that on the island, but lots of cracking going on as this thing is getting pushed from below and swelling. And there is that hornido, one of those hornidos. Lots of discoloration from the deposits of sulfurous minerals on the surface of the rock here. 
These are several tens of feet tall and fed by that lava tube system as the USGS is describing it now. So more of a lower anger angle view across. There is that central island with the main lava lake behind it, and you can see how bumpy it looks there in the background. And all this topography exists, right? The, that uh, levees that the lava lake is with is within, and then the crater wall. It's not, it's not exactly a crater, but the, the walls of the pit just behind it there, and then the spatter and cinder cone of the vents, and then overflows and Zooming it back out, this is that western bench, down drop block you might call it, which is also around 900 meters, is also pretty close. So when we talk, talk about the lava coming and fanning out, when it, once it hits that, that upper bench, it's, it actually can fan out both directions, this direction as well. Okay, only a couple more pictures I believe. So now we're looking back towards the north, Mount Achaea is in the background up here at the top of the image. This light green is a volcano golf course and the Kilauea military camp r and station here. And the north wall of Kilauea Caldera visible in the foreground here. Talk more about the geology, but I don't want to spend too much more time. Um, the main overlook would be back in this direction, Kilauea Overlook, Wekahuna. And here you can see uh, that bur the, uh, the Soper Bank area. Visitor Center being that way and steam vents being back this way. So it's an area that the USGS is reminding us that they are um, still sampling every three months, tracking long-term change. Awesome to see that. All right, that's the last photograph there. So with that, I'll transition to earthquakes because I know I'm running a little behind. So in the last year, not a whole lot going on in earthquakes in the last few months compared to what we saw uh, over a year ago, um, actually, wait, sorry, uh, six months ago or so, and close to a little under a year ago over here on the left end of the graph. So really, it's been fairly low and steady on Kilauea. I'm um, looking closer to last month. You see this normal, regular up and down. It's just natural variation you see there. Looking at the map, under Kilauea summit, under Pahala, under the south flank, that's a typical pattern. Not really huge numbers, so that these earthquake values are also capturing Pahala. Noteworthy because if Pahala has been the same active, uh, same level of activity as recently, then you don't see a whole lot in Kilauea. It's actually been fairly slow. There's our cross sections, and looking at the last month, you see a little bit better, better picture, fuller picture. Kilauea has more of these deeper earthquakes offshore, still ongoing at a lower rate than they were. It's still happening, and Pahala has got a bigger as well. So that's our earthquakes um, on Kilauea. So if we look at the earthquake map, we can see some interesting things, things here across uh, all the Hawaiian islands. Let's start from, from um, let's actually go all the way up here. There was one on Maui. There was a 2.5 that occurred yesterday evening um, at 20 kilometers depth. Typical settling earthquake occurring in Maui, nothing to worry about there. 12 kilometer deep, 2.4 Waimea, that's similar um, Mauna Kea's background signal. We just discussed Kilauea is over here, we just discussed Pahala. Pahala is interesting because you can see a little more clearly these two clusters that so far I've only seen speculation and may feed different volcanoes. And a little bit more in this area towards Kama uh, Ehua Kanaloa, I think I got it formerly known as Loihi, and if we pan over to that volcano here under under the ocean, you see there's been quite a lot of activity in the last week. There actually was a little uh, swarm of earthquakes that occurred down there. The largest one, let's get mapped, the largest one was a 3.0 and a whole bunch in the magnitude 2 range coming up here. And there was a statement put out by the USGS on Sunday afternoon. And we talked about seeing seismic tremor marked by pulses of seismic energy every 15 to 20 seconds, which was still ongoing. So 24 hours after it began, they had had two dozen magnitude 1.8 to 3.0 earthquakes on the 17th. Scientist in charge Ken Han said, this seismic activity is likely the result of magma movement beneath Kamaehua Kanaloa Seamount and currently shows no sign of leading to an eruption. 
If the swarm intensifies or changes significantly, HVA will issue additional notice. Because of the great depth of the volcano within the ocean and the style of Hawaiian eruptions, an eruption of Kamaehu on Kanaloa would pose no threat to the island of Hawaii. Neither Mauna Loa nor Kilauea volcanoes show any change in activity associated with this earthquake swarm. So uh, there's more information on there. Uh, you can see more of this. It's posted on hawaiitracker.com if you really want to go and look for it. Um, but um, this is something that uh, we've seen some questions on as well, right? Um, and there's, there's uh, essentially because Hawaiian volcanoes are not as explosive as what you see other places like Krakatau or Pinatubo or Tonga, um, that uh, you wouldn't expect that kind of that kind of um, similar event as what happened in Tonga, for example, right? It's it's the volcano is, is actually deeper than the Tonga volcano was, and that erupts in a different style most of the time, as far as we know, right? Now these volcanoes are young. Uh, the volcano is young. Something unexpected can happen that we haven't really seen documented. Um, but as far as we know, there's you know there's nothing really to worry about there. You really are better off putting your energy elsewhere. So, um, as far as uh, uh, we've had a question of tsunami from there as well, and tsunami really ultimately, ultimately uh, depends on the volume of ocean that's displaced and how fast you can displace that, that amount of water. So, uh, a regular eruption of the volcano probably wouldn't do it because you don't have enough volume coming out. The volcano is still young and, and fairly small. Um, you'd need something really dramatic, like a big landslide, you know, like we'll talk about uh, Mauna Loa, Lika slides, or that kind of thing would have to happen um, to really, really cause larger concern. And there is no sign of that happening or having happened. So energy better spent elsewhere. And I'll move on from there since I'm running out of time. All right. Um, there it is, uh, the volcano under, underwater. So uh, last thing on the earthquakes, back to Mauna Loa here. There are still some earthquakes occurring on Mauna Loa summit and in the northwest quadrant over here and on the southeast flank. But if we move to the um, earthquake rates for Mauna Loa, and let's put Mauna Loa caption up here, then you can see that they're still within that regular background. It climbed up a little bit in recent weeks, but it's come back down a little bit and essentially it's, it's normal. Looking at a GPS, similar trend there. Oh, no, not the GPS. There's a GPS. Still quite a lot of variation, but a slight rise showing expansion of the volcano. So bottom line, magma is still coming into the volcano. Um, it's doing it passively. Uh, the volcano is, is swelling very slowly, and it's seeming, seeming to shift, and we're seeing that that expresses earthquakes as well. But also nothing alarming going on there. That's, that's basically what it does. Um, just a reminder that this is all coming from the USGS HBO. This is all synthesis of their data, put out in text versions and photographs and everything else. And one final note I mentioned uh, from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, uh, reported on July 19th, power line fire 100% contained. So it was fully contained. They were still working on putting out all the embers within the, the center of the area, but um, it ended up being 42 and a half acres and 100% containment there. So the last thing I got to do here is our community corner. So let me get to that as we transition to National Park. And the first thing to mention here is that helicopter survey over Kilauea that we discussed and put out the video. Um, the, the schedule has been changing and being updated continually based on the weather. The most recent thing I saw today, let's see if it says here. Um, this one says survey start has been postponed to further notice due to weather and technical issues. But I actually saw today at some point. Oh, here we go. Now, now it loaded this way. Survey start today. So the first four flight lines perhaps occurred today. But the, the key is to keep looking on this website that's posted to see these updates uh, changing on a daily and weekly basis here. So keep your eye on that. Um, in about a week and a half, Experience Volcano Festival is coming up. So. Check that out. Oh, I better put my community text up here. So here we go. Um, so I went into that a little more detail last week. I'll do it further in the future. Um, and one last thing um, from a national park that's going to be upcoming is so load uh, the national park with the help of Professor Public Land 
Friends of Hawaii Wakinos National Park, and I'm not sure how you pronounce this, the WIS Foundation, nonprofit organization, now has Kuleana for protecting 16,451 acres at the Pohue Kahuku Beach Parcel, Makai. So the point basically being there's going to be a public meeting Saturday, August 13th, 1 to 3 p.m. in Ocean View with more meetings announced soon, right? Uh, about public access and that kind of thing. So that is it for the community corner. One last thing, Dane. One last thing is our USGS Volcano Watch this week, which honors Dr. Frank Truesdell, each for geologist, the Meritor Mer Meritorious Service Award. Um, for all his excellent work on um, not just Mauna Loa, Kilauea, um, other volcanoes, Marianas, he's been in Ecuador. You um, can read that article uh, more online. I'd, I'd like to talk more about Frank because uh, I love Frank. Um, great. Uh, Basically, uh, Mr. Uh, Mauna Loa just sums it up pretty easily. Like <laughs> the, the other so much more, on Mauna right? Loa now he's, he's, yeah. he's trained 50, he's had like 50 volunteers. He always had the most volunteers of anyone at the USGS and made a, made a point of doing that. He always like played good music in his office. There's all kinds of co cool things that I, I could dig into, but seeing as yeah. we're kind of up against the clock here, I'll leave it in case we need to, to adjust our, our uh, broadcast here. I'll come back to it. But for now, um, let me see. Um, if I can see some of these questions you've sent. Oh, let's see. I think I, see. I think I missed one thing here. I missed showing this image of the sea arch that being sent me. Let's. All right. So there's a sea arch. Uh, pictures from from National Park down at Hole by the by the coast. And if you look at the base. Um, one day apart, quite a lot of uh, erosion occurring from this big south swell occurring on the sea arch you see down there. And it's not quite clear to me what you, what's going on up here. There is extra, extra or not, um, but um, certainly something to look for right there. All right. Okay, Dan, I'm going to see if I can get this Zoom link up. Um, you have All at right. least a couple questions lined up or? Yeah, um, two here. So okay. one of them was about the uh, shift in style, um, the of the the deform or the uh, deflation inflation cycles. We seem to be getting a little bit more frequent on those, and if you think that means anything, really, um, I know previously we've talked about how the the ink, when it's doing a bunch of deflation inflation cycle cycles, that means it's more stable. Uh, generally speaking. Don't expect a significant change to be taking place, anything like that. Is that kind of what you're thinking now? Well, so we did we did see the one study that was like that, right? Um, right. That that by Anderson and, all, and um, but that doesn't always seem to hold as a thing. So there are times where it holds better than others, and right. it's kind of hard to tell where you are until after the fact. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 telling us something about what's happening in a, in that reservoir. What exactly it's telling us, that's harder to tell, but it's telling us that something a little bit different is happening than before, at the very least, that we, we, we can know that, right? And, you know, by, by the right. character of them, like by, high, by, by the fact that they're, they're deflating for so long and staying down for so long, that's different from before. That seems like a little bit different as well. And the fact that it also uh, um, coincided with that, dr that little drop in the fusion rate you know, I mean, maybe just because it was down so much, like, you know, and, but, but it seems to have picked back up since then. So I don't know. I mean, um, it's, I, I'm looking at it also and trying to see if I can tell any pattern as well, but it's really hard to tie it inclusively to, to you know, right. I just kind of see these associations and I can mention, oh, I see, this was, I, I see that happen at the same time, but I can't say exactly that A caused B and C or what have you. But yeah, um, interesting that the pattern has changed. Um, and it, certainly noticeable and if not for this most recent uh, re return of the regular eruption rate you know um, you might think something weird was going on right and maybe the gas is going down too but it doesn't seem to be what's happening all right we have a 20 dollars super chat from chris who says thank you guys for everything you do to keep us updated greatly appreciated appreciate the support we do have one more question here from Freeman who asks, uh, with all the weight of that new lava inside the lava lake that hasn't hardened under the crust, 
can it basically become a syringe from the weight and inject back into the rift zones? I mean, the, the pressure that, that exists underground in a reservoir is what's going to inject it into the rift zone. It's, it's much greater down there to even come up to the surface, right? right? From the surface pushing back down is a lot harder than it being already in the vein and just moving in through the vein rather than having to inject, inject its way back in there. That makes sense. Definitely. So, it's it's certainly at some point yeah, we so... are going to see build up in a summit, and it is going to start filling the rift zone again. It's probably going to fill the mid mid east rift zone. We're gonna, so we'll see that thing turn around, and and sometime we'll see an eruption in a upper east rift connector or that middle east rift zone as well. But it doesn't seem to be be yet. We're not seeing signs of that coming yet. And that should be predicated by earthquake activity, uh, kind of showing the transfer the transfer of lava or magma. Yeah, what we saw before yeah, is yeah, we yeah we we'd, we'd see a lot more you know as the whole areas fill up you'd see them you know first you see the GPS changing direction and then you see as it gets to full the GPS changing faster and faster and faster and then eventually uh, uh, earthquakes occurring constantly constantly like we saw for two months before 2018 in two or three months we saw the upper southwest and upper southeast rift were all quaking all the time. Right. All right, well, I think that does it for questions. I'm going to check one more time, make sure there's nothing in the chats that's pressing right now. We're just getting set up for the Zoom uh, session from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, going over some of the changes that they've been proposing and are slated to uh, take place. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on up there. Uh, still in the planning phases, so this is the time to you know get your voices heard if you have something important that you need to you know, off this, this is uh, the meeting for you. Um, I'm going to try and find a link for it real quick. See if I can pull one up. The link that I had doesn't seem to be working right. I sent it to you. So I'm looking for a new one myself. Okay. Let's see if this works. And if it does, I will send you the thing. No, it does not. Okay, yeah. And. Oh, wow. Uh, our recurring supporter, uh, Yun Zhao, came through with a 49.99 super chat. Appreciate it. He says, I truly enjoy your show. You are awesome. Appreciate the support there. Hopefully, we'll be able to figure out exactly what meeting we're supposed to be in right here. Um, does seem there there was an, some issues with the one this morning and trying to get those resolved. Join right recording here. in progress. We'll get started shortly. Okay, I got it. I'm gonna switch it over. Okay. Almost thirty. Let's go over. All right. Let's put on a national park zoom right here. All right. Looks like they're just getting set up. So yeah, as soon as they get going, we will mute ourselves and let them take at it. You can see Ken Han, the scientist in charge, USGS there. Um, oh, the name's disappeared. I was going to go down the list, but never mind. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I think you were muted for that. <laughs> I was just figuring that out myself. And while All right, so Phil's going to try and break down kind of who's in attendance here before they get going. I'm I just think, um, oh, here they go. go ahead, start it, Rhonda. Great, right, thank you. Aloha Kako. My name is Rhonda Lowe, Superintendent at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Mahalo nui loa for joining us tonight. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind folks this is a public meeting and will be video. Uh, the video will be posted on YouTube and on the Park Planning Environment and Public Comment web website or PEPC website, PEPC. Um, since 2018, uh, many of you have been following the park's progress in repairing and reopening areas on Kilauea impacted by the volcanic eruption and collapse of the caldera. The actions proposed by the National Park Service or NPS and US Geological Survey, USGS, to replace damaged buildings and relocate functions further from the rim of Kilauea Caldera is the next phase in this recovery process. Many of you provided your manao and input in, in June 2020 when, the, when we first went out to the public with some preliminary concepts and also provided comment earlier this year when we shared initial proposed actions. Your feedback helped guide us to where we are today. And this meeting, at this meeting, we will be sharing proposed actions that are further refined based on the feedback that has been provided. And we're looking forward to hearing further from you. Joining me today are several MPS and USGS staff and working on this project, individuals from OTAC and SWCA who are contracted to help us develop the design concepts and assist us through this planning process. And with that, I'd like to hand this over to Dr. Ken Hahn, scientist in chief at USGS Hawaiian Volcanoes Observatory, who also has a few words to share. Ken? You're on mute, Ken. Sorry about that. There's a big pause, oh, so now we can all go on. Um, mahalo, Rhonda. And Many, many mahalos to all of you who've uh, chosen to help out and give your opinions and your thoughts on how we can best go forward at this time to recover from the eruptions of uh, 2018. So the US Geological Survey is going to be able to build a field station, um, a place that we can stage um, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory activities within the park and adjacent areas um, within the park as part of the disaster recovery program. As part of that as well, we're going to take another U.S. Geological Survey unit, the Pacific Islands Ecosystem Research Center, which is on the opposite side of the park and will be combined into one facility. So they do important work on um, resiliency of species and invasive species and a number of other things. And so this will give us a single operating base for the U.S. Geological Survey in the park. So thank you again for participating in this process. We really appreciate and value your input. Thank you, Ken. And next up, we'll have Chad Weiser from OTAC, who will share the key changes being proposed in the Kilauea Summit area, followed by Amanda Childs from SWCA, who will be going over the issues analyzed. Bef uh, before they begin, um, I'm regarding providing verb comments, uh, you can, if you Put your name in the q and I believe there's a QA and a section um, on, the, on the screen that, and you'll be able to sign up, be put on the list and called on when it's your turn. And we will be monitoring the Q&A for comments and questions um, and adjust them verbally as time allows. And next up uh, is over to you, Chad. Aloha, everyone. Um, again, my name is Chad Weiser. I'm a principal and project manager with OTAC. We're a design 
Planning and Design Consultant to the National Park Service. And it is my pleasure to run you through you know, the, the brief history of this project and ultimately share with you the proposed action elements of the project that's part of this environmental assessment. So with that, uh, I'll, you'll be reminded throughout this presentation about the ability to comment. Uh, we're in a public comment period that lasts until July 31st. And there are a multitude of ways to comment, including comment directly on the Pepsi website that Rhonda referenced earlier. Uh, Rhonda referenced in May 2018, uh, there was a eruptive event, also included significant seismic activity where magma drained from um, the crater and ultimately uh, included an earthquake that was quite damaging to some of the facilities in and around the crater edge, specifically at that Kahuna Bluff. Um, those buildings that were impacted in that location included the Jagger Museum, the Okamura Building, as well as the uh, geochemical annex building that's used by the USGS. That really triggered uh, this project and how it's evolved. And the project has resulted in really four different areas within the park that include project elements. One is the bluff where we mentioned, which is number one on this map. It's primarily involves deconstruction of some of the buildings that were damaged uh, in the event but also some minor improvements for viewing and continued public use. Uh, area two is the construction of the USGS field station that was referenced by Ken to support their activities. Number three is the construction of a replacement visitor center that's essentially replacing functions at the Jagger Museum that were lost. And number four is a realignment and modifications to circulation at the entrance to accommodate some of these changes and address some safety issues that have persisted in that area. All of this is really driven by a basic purpose and need statement. It's, it's kind of obvious in this case, I think that it's really about um, restoring and enhancing um, facilities and, and spaces, both for visitor use and enjoyment, but also for park and USGS operations and to also improve the interagency response when there is eruptive activity. Um, this area right here uh, reflects the USGS spaces that were impacted uh, during the eruption and in, in some of the buildings that are actually being proposed for removal. You can see they take up a significant uh, space and usage area at the bluff. And as a result, the USGS kind of evaluated how they would like to proceed operationally. Some of those functions will be relocated to a new facility in Hilo, but they will continue to have a field station in the park to support sort of advanced search and monitoring. So after addressing the fact that there would be lost facilities in this location, there was a need to consider what are the what portion or amount of those facilities need to be um, relocated in the park to meet operational functions as well as visitor demand and needs and so part of the early part of this project that has been part of what Rhonda mentioned in 2020 there was some outreach on was concepts of where to site those facilities so i'm going to just briefly walk you through some of what was considered with regard to these facilities. And just know that there was a significant process to evaluate the sitting of these facilities. Uh, there's a process called a value analysis that the Park Service uses to help them with very objective decision making in approaching these projects. Excuse me. Here we go. I'm going to go to our left side here. So the 
first concept that was considered was to construct a USS field station in and near the Kilauea Visitor Center. Um, and in association with that, a, a new visitor center that's right under this area here. So those two new buildings being very near the entrance area of the park. So that was one concept for siting. Another concept was relocating from what I just showed the visitor center on this side of Crater Rim Drive to the north side adjacent to the KVC. And with this concept, the USGS facility is located near the VEOC down the Crater Rim Drive south section. A third concept was to expand the KVC with essentially an addition or an adjacent building. Um, in this case, um, this concept, the USBS field station was considered in an area that's uh, probably existing ball field next to the Kilauea military camp site. And then lastly, the fourth concept that was considered was a combination of those two facilities, Visitor Center, USGS Field Station, in that same location at the ball field adjacent to the KMC. After that VA process, a preferred concept was developed. Um, and from that, it was determined that the most suitable location for a new visitor center was this looking here, adjacent to the KVC, leveraging some of the operational efficiencies that that might bring. For the USGS, it was felt that the location out near the KMC, near the ball field, was the most suitable for their operational needs in supporting monitoring of the volcano. So that preferred concept then moved forward and as those have been developed further, um, as we've received comment through the outreach process, we have refined those considered cultural natural resource impacts, operational considerations to try to develop the best uh, preferred proposed action that we can for the project. And so we're going to describe that in a little bit more detail for all of you. First at Ue uh, Kahuna Bluff, I want to first reference that the buildings in red here, the Okamura building, the Jagger Museum, and the Annex building are the three buildings proposed to be demolished. You know, they were all damaged to some extent as part of the event. And there was much discussion about whether to try to repair those facilities in place or relocate them as determined uh, it would be better to relocate. With the removal of those buildings, there's an opportunity to uh, restore those areas to a more natural landscape, which are the areas in green. The Okamura building has a basement and actually when the base was dug, there was a berm created over in this area. We're gonna use some of that berm to fill back in the basement, bring it up to grade. Also up at the site is a water tank. That's, there's two water tanks and they're proposed to be removed and replaced with one that will serve water associated with this comfort station that will remain as well as the nearby campground that it serves. And the only other uh, vertical element out at the site that's man-made will be a small radio building and radio communications tower that supports operational functions in the area. So a little more detailed plan shows some other improvements. This uh, banding area right here is a reflection of the footprint of the existing Jagger Museum. Once that building is demolished, the plan is to utilize some of that area for an expanded overlook because this continues to be a popular location for the visiting public to view the crater and any volcanic activity that might be occurring. It would include some addition of benches, um, but also retaining some of the historic features such as the historic retaining wall that surrounds this area. 
again, the comfort station will remain to serve uh, the visiting public. Some parking would remain as well, and the large parking lot would remain in, in place. So one other thing that was done through this EA process is to look at impacts to views. Uh, so right now, this is from a view from near the volcano house. Looking across the crater, here's the bluff area. You can see some small uh, reference to buildings that exist. This slider view allows people, if you have a chance to go look at this story map online, is to see yourself how the view would change with the removal of those buildings. And so that's a particular positive impact associated with the project. This is another view. Existing view from the Crater Rim Trail as you're approaching this area of the bluff. Once we remove the building, part of the berm to fill in the basement, this would be the resulting view associated with this area. Okay, we're gonna move on to area two that was referenced in our earlier map graphic. This is the US Fieldston uh, project. And this project uh, is really located next to the KMC and proposed to include uh, a new building to serve some of the functions at the site. And show you a site plan. Well, first I'll show you, here's a view slider of this area. I'm gonna reload this. There we go. So this is the site right here next to the Kilauea military camp. Um, there, this is the ball field that was referenced. The decision was to locate the building in a cluster of trees screened from Crater Rim Drive, and we'll show that view again here in a minute. Here's the site plan, the Flexa New Field Station, some small ancillary improvements, including water associated with that. Much small, smaller building, 15,000 square feet. This is a significant reduction from the footprint they had at Uekuna Bluff again, because some um, functions will be relocated to Hilo. Just some graphics of the exterior of the building, uh, gable style building, um, two floors, trying to minimize the footprint of the building uh, on the site and the associated parking to minimize impacts to both natural and cultural resources. Re use of uh, native stone, similar materials to other buildings in the area for compatibility. The building is split into two halves, one for research laboratories and other um, office administrative functions. This is a view as you're coming from the parking lot into the entry. And then this was the slider view I was just showing you earlier. This is existing conditions. And then this is where the building's tucked into the vegetated area. So very out of view from the general public. Okay, we're gonna move on to the third location that was on the map, which is the proposed visitor center. Um, some of the buildings you see here are existing buildings. This building right here is the Kilauea Visitor Center, exists now. Uh, this building right here is the Volcano House. This is the entry station as you come into the park, so if, to get everyone oriented. The area in yellow is the area that's being considered for improvements, some of which is existing parking, um, and some is existing vegetated area that was disturbed at one time. As we move in, one of the things that uh, made sense about locating the visitor center in this area is because of some of the administrative functions that are in the KVC. And then one of the thoughts too is to take some of the visitor interaction 
that's part of the current KVC, merged that with the new visitor center and repurposed parts of the KVC. That area would then be used for indoor park programs, special events, K-12 educational programming. Again, here's the uh, view. This area right here is the existing parking lot that we're showing in this location. This begins to show you an overview of how this new building will fit into the context of the area. It's very important. There's a number of cultural districts, historic districts that this fits within. So its sensitivity to existing buildings is very important. This is the Kilauea Visitor Center. This is the proposed new visitor center. So you can see the size and scale of it. It's positioning in the landscape, set back from a crater rim drive, is very comparable in size and scale uh, as a nod to those existing facilities. Here is a site plan of this location. This is the new building. Um, the approach to this visitor center was to definitely have interior enclosed space to house sales as well as a lobby and exhibit area, as well as restrooms and a small administrative support, but also a very large exterior lanai that will house other additional exhibits and create space for outdoor programs that support uh, functions with the park. With this, building also was some expansion of parking. One of the things that was heard through the process was uh, really the amount of parking that's being proposed and, and the number was reduced um, significantly from what was proposed earlier just to minimize impacts associated with the development of the site. Um, this is a floor plan of the building. The colored areas represent interior space, as mentioned, sales area, lobby. This would be the front door into the lobby. Uh, this is a bus drop off area. Parking is over to the right. So there's two routes to come for the visiting public into this building. Um, beyond the lobby is an exhibit space some back of the house administrative functions, and then a separate restroom that uh, feeds in through an exterior door rid of the rest of the functions in the building. You can see again, this is the large uh, exterior covered lanai space. These are some graphics of the exterior of the building. As was mentioned, Earlier, the building is in a historic district. The KVC is one of those historic buildings. So much of the architecture is modeled off compatibility with that building, including choice of materials, um, roof style, roof slopes. And so see some similarities between this new proposed building and the KVC. There's a natural stone base uh, with a wood type siding that matches some of those existing facilities. There is an intent to offset electrical costs with photovoltaics. So that's an important thing with sustainability for this new facility for the long term. Here's another view. This is a view coming from the parking lot into this space. As you can see, this space will be used for exhibits as well. Off to the right is the entrance to the restroom. This space here is an additional lanai space that will be provided if funding allows, at least for this round of construction. Another slider view. Um, this right here represents existing conditions. As I mentioned, there's existing parking lot that's actually sort of where the building will be constructed. So some of that parking is being replaced with the new proposed parking. One additional view coming from the west, heading east towards the exit to the park. So this is existing conditions, 
KVCs off to the left. You can see in the distance, just barely, you can see new roof line for a new structure. Right, and the last project element of this before we go start getting into, um, and I guess there's one other small element I'll mention, but we'll get into impact topics for the environmental assessment. Uh, one of the things that uh, needed to be addressed was one, accessing the new visitor center, but also some uh, major safety concerns related to the current entrance off of Highway 11, but also congestion that's associated with that and challenging turning movements for visitors. Um, there's an existing crater rim drive south that takes you to the chain of craters area. Uh, the current situation right now is this intersection is right about where the entrance station is. So some turning movements are actually restricted where visitors coming in can't make that turn, forces them into the park to turn around into the rest of the activity, very inefficient. Uh, you have people making turns there in unsafe condition. So a lot of challenges in addition, uh, the capacity kind of as you come into the park through the entry station during peak periods does cause backup of vehicles that at times back up to the highway, creating safety issues. So we're, the solutions that we were looking at here were really to solve a number of challenges um, associated with this space. So what was developed? Uh, associated with this. First and foremost, this was the existing alignment of the southern extension of Crater Rim Drive <clears throat> that is realigned to actually what was a historically old alignment of Crater Rim Drive for the most part. <clears throat> and so that that intersection could be put further beyond the entry station, which right here. And because there are very quite a few turning movements the proposed action includes a roundabout as a way to create better circulation and reduce congestion in this area. Uh, in addition, at the entry station, there was an added proposed action for an added lane that would be an administrative lane. A significant percentage of entrance to the park are administrative staff associated with working at the park, commercial users, K, people uh, working at KMC, and thus they are not paying the entry fees. And so the, the goal was to bring a lane, dedicated lane for those administrative functions to help them operationally get through the gate, but also to reduce the amount of backup in the visitor lanes to the highway. I have a few more graphics to illustrate this. Uh, this is a more detailed blow up of the area. Um, I know there's there's a couple of roundups on the island. One maybe functions more better than the other. We can assure you that this has been designed uh, appropriately for the type of function, the amount of traffic, the size and scale appropriate for the types of vehicles that would come through this site. Um, one additional item is we created a safer employee parking for those that work at the entrance station, and that's represented in this location. We located that where there's already disturbed land, where there's the existing roadway right now. Here's some graphics as you're entering uh, the entrance station. Off to the right is this proposed administrative lane, which widens the entry of one lane more than it is currently. This is graphic showing the roundabout as this is kind of the direction as though you're exiting the park. There's the entry station right here. And then we also have a video simulation that I'll just run, let run briefly that illustrates kind of the flow of traffic and the proposed improvements. Administrative lane off to the right, small visitor pull off for those exiting, looking for directions. As you come through this space, merge back, back down and enter the roundabout. Off to the right is the visitor new visitor center. Straight ahead is Crater Rim Drive towards the bluff. And off to the left is the turn towards Chain of Craters. 
show you some views. This is existing conditions. This is that expanded and relocated intersection now in the form of a roundabout. And then lastly, one additional opportunity, as was mentioned by Ken, um, the Pierce operating unit of USGS has the opportunity to relocate into the field station that would be constructed as one of the proposed actions. And if that were to occur, they would be vacating three or a couple of buildings, one or two buildings in this location that opens up for the National Park Service to utilize. And as such, there's three buildings that the Park Service would essentially deconstruct and remove. And based on their age and condition, that's why they were selected so that the staff could move into the area vacated by Pierce. All right, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Amanda Towns, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Chad. Aloha, everyone. My name is Amanda Childs. I'm with SWC Environmental Consultants. We are the team that was assisting the park in developing the EA. Um, I'm going to do a brief summary of the issues that were determined to be driving issues to develop in the EA to understand the potential impacts of the proposed action. Um, so some of our impact topics here, the first one we're going to briefly discuss is the Nene. Um, and the brief conclusions of, from the Nene is they're subject to noise and visual disturbance that will happen during the construction period. The park has developed mitigation measures that there can be no activity within 150 feet of breeding or nesting nene to make sure that we're not disturbing those breeding or nesting birds. Uh, they could also be indirectly disturbed uh, for those that are foraging or flying from noise, lights, human activity, vehicle activity that are associated with the construction and deconstruction activities. It'd be intermittent, result in some short-term adverse impacts by increasing that baiting level. The Park Service has consulted with US Fish and Wildlife Service and has made a determination that the project may affect, but is not likely to adversely affect the NANA. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service has provided concurrence on that determination. The other uh, second resource topic that we're looking at, the second issue is native forest removal. Deconstruction of the pro and construction of the project result in the removal of 108 trees that are greater than about six inches in diameter at breast height, with 75 of those being ohias. As part of um, preparing for the project, if a, the proposed action is selected, the park has begun air layering on potentially affected trees to clone them and preserve their lineage. Those clones would be genetically identical to the removed trees and adapted to local conditions to be used in reveg. As Chad has already discussed quite a bit in showing you those sliders early on with the proposed action, view sheds is obviously a very big issue for this project. We're changing the view sheds quite a bit. Um, the removal of those structures up on the bluff, as you saw from the visual simulation, is going to provide a more um, an experience that's more in tune with the natural, the cultural, and historic character up there for, and increase the in, interpretive opportunities. The, as he showed earlier in the slider, the USGS field station is partially compatible with that existing landscape, um, but it's, the visitors are not likely going to be able to see it due to that vegetation that will be there. The replacement visitor center is going to expand the area that is viewed as in the modified visitor services zone. It leads to a more recreation focused landscape, a new building on that landscape. The vegetation clearing that's proposed to accommodate the traffic circle and the new entrance would interrupt the existing continuity of the forest and have a new focal point as you come through the park entrance station. Um, we will modify that densely vegetated corridor and it will be more open. The deconstruction of the non-historic buildings in the resource management complex is would decrease the amount of human-made uh, buildings in the area, but there's a lot of dense forest and the visitors would unlikely notice a change. 
The next topic is cultural landscapes and historic structures. Um, I just wanted to say that cultural landscapes are defined as a geographic area uh, associated with a historic event and activity or persons that exhibit other cultural or aesthetic values. So, so we're talking about cultural. There are three cultural landscapes and one NRHP nominated sites that are relevant to the project and intersect the APE. While construction of uh, up on the bluff is considered very beneficial to the ethnographic resource, the removal of the Jagger Museum is an adverse effect to the Crater Rim Historic District. And the siting of the new USGS building within that existing vegetation, there's the colors were chosen purposefully to help that building blend in with the surroundings. The proposed location at the edge of the Crater Rim Historic District and adjacent to the historic ball field not visible from the main locations, so the determination was made that there would be no adverse effect on the Crater Rim Historic District from the USGS building. The installation of the roundabout is uh, determined to have an adverse effect on the integrity of the Crater Rim Historic District because it introduces a road intersection configuration and a new width of a road that's not compatible. And then the replacement visitor center is, has been designed to comply with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation and would be consistent with the existing architecture and compatible with the size of the KVC um, headquarters areas Chad has already alluded to. Um, would represent a direct adverse effect on the historic district by introducing the new building and the parking lot into that district. Moving on to ethnographic resources and ethnographic resources are the cultural and the natural features of a park that are time honored significance to traditionally associated peoples. So that's the definition of that. The determination here is that the project construction and the deconstruction activities on the bluff would occur over a two period. And during that time frame, the park service is going to would implement a project requirement that no loud outdoor deconstruction or construction work could occur with 60 minutes after sunrise and 60 minutes before sunset. This is the time when many people come to the area for cultural practices. Uh, those actions would minimize, but they're not going to avoid the adverse impacts to the tra traditional practices, but the effects would cease when the construction period ends. The long-term deconstruction of the buildings at the bluff would result in a beneficial effect um, because those structures are considered inappropriate as an ethnographic resource. <clears throat> also important is that the proposed action would move up to 75 Ohia trees during the construction of the park entrance and the visitor center and the USGS field station. It would eliminate that ethnographic resource, the, the Ohia trees, as it would remove a section of the forested area that uh, some individual sense a spiritual and a heritage connection to. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the Park Service is currently cleaning those trees to be able to replace them. Uh, health and human safety is another topic that was raised. Um, removal of those buildings up on the bluff, uh, de deconstructing those buildings on the bluff would increase the um, health and human safety for both visitors and park staff. Um, as Chad showed, they are quite damaged. Um, by removing the buildings at the bluff and, and putting a more natural intact setting, uh, the park interpretive themes would be more cl clearly communicated to reflect the sacredness of the area, resulting in a, a long-term beneficial impact to visitor use and experience. Then we're gonna move back down to the entrance area. So the, the addition of a new entrance lane and the conversion of the intersection into a roundabout is intended to address the safety issues that are currently occurring that Chad has already alluded to. The new entrance lane allows that administrative traffic to bypass the visitor traffic more quickly, allows for two full visitor lanes, resulting in less frequent backups onto Highway 11. And then the visitor confusion on where to go at that intersection would be removed. The roundabout creates a more free flowing form activity, allows for safer connectivity and turns towards the visitor center, crater rim drive west, east and the exit lane. So the, the, the introduction of these new elements is, would have a long-term beneficial impact to health and human safety. And then thinking of the replacement visitor center, down a little bit more, Chad. All of the actions that we discussed above would have a positive 
increase or positive impact on visitor use and experience, but the visitor uh, center would provide a space to engage visitors that as they first enter and impart ne the knowledge necessary for them to have a safe and responsible, respectful visit to the sacred place. The visitor center has also been designed to help solve the issues of, of, of the overcrowding that has been increased due to the closure of Jagger at the bluff. Um, it would allow for greater opportunities for interpretive, um, sorry, better, better <laughs> greater opportunities for interpretive, I'm saying it wrong again, greater interpretive opportunities for uh, both indoors and outdoors with some increased exhibit space, the lanai areas, um, increasing the importance of the location to further the interpretive themes of the park and the stories that get told to the visitors. The proposed action would result in a long-term beneficial impact to visitor use and experience. Um, and that is the end of those issues that were raised for the EA. The EA is available on the Pepsi website. We'll put a link in the chat here and you can see the impact topics that were raised and dismissed as well. We're, um, we did do some small analysis on determine if they were driving issues for the EA. Mahalo, Amanda. Thank you. And I think at this point we're open to questions and comments. I have a, there are some few questions in the Q&A here. First question, will there be out of house access to the restrooms and also will there be water bottle fill and drinking fountains with the new restrooms? Good question is in terms of uh, restroom hours, I think it would be, I'm guessing it'd be similar. I don't think we got that far in the details. That's a, it sounds like a suggestion. Yeah, and, I think the the design Rhonda would allow or accommodate for for that yeah. opportunity, and then in addition, yes, there will be water fountains and water bottle filling stations associated with it. Yeah. All right. Duly noted. Thanks. All right. An additional question. Uh, excuse me, can the new entrance station allow an express type lane for those with annual passes, et cetera? I suppose it, it's something we could consider. And so I think that's a, that's a good comment. Um, I know the original intention was for administrative use, which is quite significant, but that's something that uh, could be considered and explored. Okay. Um, the third question, a question from YouTube, is cloning trees better than replanting them? I'm going to put that one to Sierra, our natural resource manager, she's on. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the question. So that approach of air layering is just one step to get to the replanting. So we are currently propagating um, a lot of different species of native plants for um, replanting and ohia is one of them. And so there's two ways to get your plant to the outplant stage. And one of them is that air layering process. But we would take that air layer and plant it in the ground as a tree um, in the nearby area with that realignment of Crater Rim Drive. And another way that we would be growing ohia is through seeds. So it's just two different ways to get to the outplant stage. Thanks for the question. Thank you. So for those of you that are uh, attendees to this webinar, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen underneath Chad's picture of the rainbow here. If you have any questions, go ahead and, and put them in there. If you would like to provide a verbal comment, you can also put your name in that Q&A and we can call on you.
All right, another comment question just came in. All the improvements proposed seem to be a good thing. I'm not objecting to them, but a little surprised that the visitor station falls under 2018 eruption recovery. It seems unrelated to the 2018 eruption to me, but I don't see anything in this about um, EJ restoring some of the trails on the caldera floor. Yeah, so the so disaster recovery funding is there was a bill that uh, the park was a beneficiary of that address that the funding was provided to help address uh, facilities damage. So we did actually use some initial funds to do the damage assessments, do some repairs to the summit trails. Um, also to minor damage to buildings and I, I think both, and also fences. But we haven't yet addressed the areas down in the crater. And, and part of that is there are significant damage to the floor of the crater and the trails in the crater. And um, I don't think there's an easy solution for that because you know, a good half of that half of the trail that used to go along the bottom of the crater floor actually fell in. So, but where we could restore the trail and safely bring people, that's what we've done. Rhonda, do you mind if I help with yeah. the, one of one of the aspects of that question? I think was the connection of the new visitor center. Mm -hmm to the 2018 event. And the primary connection is that the park was losing the Jagger Museum, which was a visitor center facility right on the bluff. And so the new visitor center in part is to replace that function. Thank you, Chad. Well, uh, folks are thinking, um, it was pointed out I missed the um, operations section. My apologies. I, <laughs> Chad was probably like, Let, I'm going to go back really quick on that piece. <laughs> All right. So another was, uh, issue impact topic that obviously needed to be analyzed was uh, what would be the impacts on the park and the USGS operations from this proposed action. So during the two year deconstruction construction activities, there's gonna be potentially some additional issues with staffing due to having to direct visitors and traffic around the active project areas. But overall, there's a long-term beneficial impact to those park operations because there's that replacement visitor center that was being asked about how it's connected. That we're losing the Jagger Museum, the replacement visitor center is supposed to kind of address that issue. Um, so, in, and also with just the one visitor center, instead of having the one in lower and the one up on the bluff, um, it, it could be easier to staff and allow flexibility to provide those interpretive programs, those hikes, and more, ed more educational opportunities throughout the park again, and provide the park staff with the ability to maintain the facilities in an efficient manner without having to travel between different areas of the park. Um, the improved parking lot, the roundabout traffic signs uh, would potentially remove the amount, reduce the amount of time that park staff have to spend directing traffic in the parking lot, of which they do quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> there would be some short-term adverse impacts from construction vehicles potentially conflicting with USGS access if there is an eruption or another type of emergency. Um, but after that period ends, having the facility of, within the park and the ability to have that separate emergency entrance ensures that the HVO staff can continue to maintain their monitoring equipment and rapidly respond to additional events and would be a long-term beneficial impact. Thanks, Amanda. I have another question in the chat. 
Aloha, Reuse Hawaii is interested in developing and helping with the deconstruction. Can we survey the site with you folks? When is the deconstruction solicitation going out? I think that might be a question for Brian. Not sure he's um, able I, to speak. I can allow Brian to talk. Well oh, done. you can. Okay. Brian, if you can unmute. Aloha, everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, can you repeat that question, please? It was yes. uh, reuse. To the yeah, reuse. Time. Reuse Hawaii is interested in helping with the deconstruction. Can we survey the site with you folks? When is the deconstruction solicitation going out? Uh, uh, late in the year, right around um, December, I believe. And that would, if I can add to that, would also depend on, we're in, in the NEPA process right now, no decision has been made. There is a proposed action, there is a no action alternative, and there's still this public comment period. The proposed action could additionally even change after we get comments. So it's not, not a decision yet, so we can't, it's not 100% that the solicitation, I just wanted to clarify. Another question in the chat, would access to the old KMC ball field be curtailed? I believe we're trying to keep that open even during construction, but um, definitely after construction, it'll be available. Um, I think uh, it'll, during construction, it'll really depend on how much space the um, contractor's going to need to stage material and have trucks and equipment staged there. During that construction, deconstruction During, period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, a follow up to the, the question about the trails uh, is the suggestion could you consider, for example, connecting? The Hale Maumau Trail, did I say it right? Okay. To the Byron Ledge Trail on the caldera floor without crossing the caldera towards the collapsed crater area. This to me would seem like a good mitigation of loss of trails from the 2018 eruption. I think if Danielle wants to take this one. Sure. Um, aloha. So uh, right now, the Hale Maumau Trail actually does connect to the Byron Ledge Trail. Just you go down and then you go back up. But I believe what you're asking is about the other side of the Byron Ledge Trail. And um, we looked at that. Um, there's a few issues with opening that back up, um, one being on the crater floor. Um, being in a sacred space, but also as you get further along the Fire and Ledge Trail and even getting over to there, it's um, there's a lot of earth cracks and other kind of volcanic things. So um, we could look at it again sometime in the future when there's not an active eruption in the crater. But right now, I think because of the active eruption, we wouldn't really want to do that. But I think even just the way that crater fell, you'll see a ton of fractures and they're very, uh, they're, pr they're pretty significant cracks that are pretty wide. Um, and new ones forming all the time. Yeah. It's continuing to change. Yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it wouldn't, it's not a typical trail that you would open for people, it'd be pretty arduous and dangerous. Yeah, those crevasses are pretty deep. We are actually going to be doing some uh, Kilauea Summit corridor planning, I think in another year and a half. Is that it, Danielle? Where we're re-looking at uh, visitor use in the summit area. 
and those are opportunities for the public to weigh in on types of use, including new trails, um, such. So that is something we're going to revisit because I, pe people recognize that circulation in the summit area has changed significantly because not just because it's 2018, but also the 2008 eruption. Good comments and questions. There aren't any additional in the Q&A and we are at the top of the hour. If you would like to do your closeout Rhonda and I will put the link in the chat so folks know where to go with it for additional comments. Go ahead. All right, well, first of all, thank you everybody for attending this meeting. Um, virtuals are hard. Uh, but I appreciate uh, you staying with us and I really wanna thank the presenters. There was a lot, of, a lot of effort over the last few years to get us to this point. Um, I wanna thank uh, folks for attending and sharing their mana'o. And, and again, you know, there'll be opportunities to send in your comments as well, um, not, not just, at this meeting, but you can uh, send in your comments. I think there's directions on the on the on the chat Q and A. Is that it? Um, so we look forward to hearing from you. I mean, we do listen. Uh, we have modified uh, the alternatives after each of the uh, engagement public engagement periods where we've given us our feedback. So thank you. And uh, you'll hear more about the process in the in the coming weeks and months. So, mahalo nu iloa, and a hui ho. Have a great evening. All right, you guys. So we're back, Dan and I. So that meeting yeah. went pretty well, it seemed. Um, we'll yeah, went pretty smooth. Comment period's open for another 10 days till July 31st of the month. So you guys have the, the link to go and check that out. Yeah, and I kind of uh, thinking about the whole the whole thing about the trails. The trails are interesting, but like it's really not the topic of this particular EA, right? This EA is more about the visitor centers and the buildings. So I also like that but I will have to have, have to join the voices at that planning session that uh, superintendent mentioned coming up. I think she's here. So anything, Dane, to to add on at the end of this? No, I, you know it was a good presentation. Glad we you know brought it to you live. Um, otherwise, you know you'd have to get into the Zoom. So we had a decent amount of people that were able to piggyback in to get a you know firsthand live view of that. So that's always awesome. Do leave your comments if you have anything for that. We will be back next week at our normally scheduled time, 5 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. That is when we go live, um, bring you a weekly update. If anything does happen in between that time, we will go live with a special session, but really not expecting that. But, you know, you never know what could happen. If it does, we will go live. Um, and if we don't, if nothing doesn't happen, you know, next week, Thursday, 5 p.m. Do we have some thank yous that we need to get through, Dane? Oh yeah, we had one. Uh, I believe uh, I, I, I think I mentioned Yan Zhao's uh, super chat. Um, do want to also mention Kaleo's Bar and Grill, who's our longtime supporter as well. They have two locations: one in Pahoa, one in Oak, uh, Orchidland. The new one is out in Orchidland, so if you want to see that new establishment, check them out. Uh, Kai Kamarzo and the guys from down in Kalapana that used to play down there, they perform Thursday nights as well. Definitely a treat to go see. Um, give like a little private concert there. Make reservations for that one because that thing is packed. Um, other than that, I think that does it for this week. Uh, until next time, that's it. Yeah, we run along, and that's because of the, uh, the meeting. And mahalo to the White Wilkins National Park and the USGS, uh, allowing us to stream that and try to spread their communication a little bit further. So if that helped you guys, leave us a comment. Let us know. Until next week, we'll see you then.
from Hawaii Tracker. He's Dane DuPont. I'm Philip Ong. Aloha, everyone.